Okay, so up next, we have another speaker right away here for you, so don't go anywhere. We are going to be talking about hacking your vacation and using data science for fun. And I'm excited for this topic because I think all of us are starting to really think about exploring the world again, starting uh, to think about our vacations. And so we have Becky Gandion, who's going to be joining us here on stage. Becky is the practice lead for data and analytics for Centric Consulting in St. Louis. There she is. Hello. Yeah. Becky. Made um, it. You did. You made it. You are on this global stage. Um, yes. So Becky here specializes in data storytelling, data strategy and visualization, which I know so many of us in our jobs wish we had a Becky that could help visualize all the things that we're working on. I know I need one. Um, Self-declared big Disney nerd, Becky, as well. Very so much so. This, I think I think we're going to see some of this in your talk today, that you spend some of your free time, though, analyzing and predicting crowd patterns at Disney World, which is so interesting. And you also love blogging. You have over 90 blog posts in the last year alone about Disney data. And most importantly, you are a mom to two intelligent, strong-willed, red-headed girls. Um, and shout out, shout out to the redheaded girls. That's right, we're matching well today. I like <laughs> right, I know this has been great timing here, um, and I swear that was in Becky's bio. I didn't just add it for my own sake. <laughs> uh, so, Becky, you are going to tell us about how data does not have to be stuffy; it can be powerful and meaningful and still fun. And I cannot wait. So, over to you. Right, thank you. I really appreciate the timing of going from important life-saving technology to vacations that really set me up well for success here. But I'm excited to talk about Disney and vacation and using data for fun. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here so that we can see all of the fun animations uh, along with what I'm doing. So hopefully you all be able to see this. We're gonna talk about making numbers powerful, meaningful, and fun. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, who I am. So thank you so much for that wonderful intro. We covered some of this. I do actually have a background in biomedical engineering. That's what my training, my early career was doing. So I was loving that GE talk and hearing about all of the cool things that they were doing. I purchased and helped maintain medical equipment for the Department of Veterans Affairs for about a decade early in my career. Before I got into the world of consulting, and did a lot of data and analytics. I have some architecture certifications, did data science, computer visualization, all kinds of things. Uh, and now I've really found my niche in this data strategy, road mapping, storytelling world. But uh, as was said, more importantly than that, I am mom to two beautiful girls who I'm raising not only to be Disney fans, but to be strong thinkers. Uh, I'm really proud that they automatically assume that women are the ones that go get jobs in the family and that dads stay home with the kids. I love that about them and I hope they keep that. I'm also a lifelong Disney fan. I'm a vacation super planner. I have vacations planned in spreadsheets years in advance, literally. Uh, I blog like crazy. I had two blog posts released earlier today. I also have in my own YouTube series explaining how to do Disney vacations. And the fact that it requires a 12 or more video series means that vacationing has gotten complicated. What we're gonna talk about today is this crowd and touring analytics piece of things. How can you use data to make better vacations? So in my head, every problem starts with goals. I have a problem statement. I want my vacation to be great. I have to break that into goals. I want to avoid crowds. I want to save money and I want to enjoy my vacation. And we've got a short little time today, so I'm going to focus in on using data to avoid those crowds at Disney World because Disney is a tale of two places. If you go at the wrong time, it's just a sea of humanity and you hate yourself for spending money to be there. Or you can go and have a really great time with less people. And so that's what we're going to focus in on today. So what's the problem? Why is this a problem? If we think about just one day at the Magic Kingdom, which is sort of the flagship Disney theme park in the United States at least, we have to take into consideration park capacity because this has actually been changing since reopening after the pandemic. It's been expanding, but it's still not up to full capacity. So we have to understand that constraint. We have to know how attendance changes on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Are there more popular times to go? Times when you can go when there are less people? And park attendance also varies by hour. So maybe if I go in the morning or late at night, I can avoid some of those peak times. Ticket costs drive sales and drive demand and sort of reflect that demand. I need to think, take that into account. Operating hours, how long of a day is there? Are people going to be squished into a shorter amount of time? How many attractions are there? There's 29 to 39 of them in just Magic Kingdom. Where are people going and when? On top of that, when are they eating and where are they eating? And how does that absorb crowds? There's 33 different dining locations just in Magic Kingdom that they can choose from. 13 shopping locations, so they could spend time spending more money and that would take them away from other places. In addition to all these different uh, dining locations, they all have different preferences and quality and how does that impact where people should go and where they do go. Uh, different attractions have different popularity. So does that mean crowds distribute in different ways? Same thing with dining. There's all these upsell opportunities now. You can pay your way around lines. Is that ever worth it? Do people do that? And on top of all this, you have to make park reservations and tell Disney where you're going uh, weeks and weeks and weeks in advance. Wow, that's a lot to take into consideration. Bonus, that's just at Magic Kingdom. And all at Disney World property, we have to multiply that by four different parks, Epcot, Hollywood Studios, and Animal Kingdom, plus two water parks, plus a dedicated shopping district, uh, plus 34 resorts that people could choose to stay at rather than going to a park. Holy moly, that's a lot of data and a lot of things we're trying to solve for. So part of my job, my side gig, really, uh, for fun is to piece together an answer. And these are all the sorts of different data sources I can use to do that. We can look at school calendars, for example, and try to see uh, if a bunch of schools are out. That probably means a bunch of people are going to Disney because it's a lot of families with kids that are going to travel during those school breaks. I can look at economic data, travel data, prior year results, operational info. If a big ride is down, that's going to impact capacity. I can also collect my own data, and that's what you're going to see on the right side of the screen. I can scrape Disney's posted wait times. Disney has an app. Uh, on your phone for when you go to the park that tells you all the wait times. And it's pretty easy to get that data on your own. I also have my own app so users can submit their own wait times and give us that data on a regular basis. There's an in-park testing team that goes and tests out different strategies, surveys, available reservation scraping. So tons of different data sets to solve tons of different problems. When you put all that together, we're going to use data science to be able to help us to avoid crowds. Side note, this picture is before the park even opens on a regular day. And this is when park capacity was limited to about half capacity. So take this and multiply it. And that's what you're seeing at Disney on a quote unquote normal day, uh, not my idea of a vacation. And that's why I try to crunch the data to avoid that. So how do we do the data science? We take all these different data sources and actually in a pretty simple architecture, store them in AWS. Uh, use Python and do some uh, tree networking, uh, store some of those results in SAS. And that generates this big model um, where we're looking at the wait times for various attractions, predicting them throughout the day, and we output that as a number. And so on the right here, you can see this crowd calendar at Disney World for the next five days. So this updates in real time, not on the presentation, obviously, but I pulled this last night. And we can see on a scale of one to 10, one being empty, 10 being New Year's Eve, uh, the whole park is sold out, how crowded we think it's going to be at each park on each day. And we can see that this changes on a day to day basis and on a park to park basis. And that can help us decide where we might want to go. What are the impacts of this? So zooming back in on our Magic Kingdom example, we see some of the big attractions here. If we focus on the first one, Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, you can see its average posted weight at these different crowd levels from one to 10. And we actually force these into a bell curve. So some of the very, very most empty days of the year will be level one. Some of the very, very, very most crowded days of the year will be level 10, but almost everything will be in that four, five, six range. And that gives you sort of the average crowds. Bonus, this looks like a roller coaster, which is totally on theme for this presentation. So that makes my heart happy. What does this look like? On the least crowded days of the year, which, spoiler alert, if you take anything from this presentation, it is always the week after Labor Day. Uh, so I have those example days here. Everything's a crowd level one. 
no one wants to take their kids out of school right after the school year gets started. So for, for, this is typically when my family goes to Disney World. We can see what that means on this crowd level one day at Magic Kingdom. Yeah, you might have an hour long wait for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. Everything else is pretty reasonable. I don't mind waiting 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, there's still a ways to even get it better than that. But these aren't too bad. If I look on the other end of the spectrum, and this is the week of Thanksgiving, really, really popular time to go to Disney World, I start seeing some of these nines and tens. And if I look at a nine specifically and then go over on my handy dandy chart, I can see instead of waiting an hour for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, I'm now waiting three hours for Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. And that's using up an awful lot of my day that I paid a lot of money to spend at the Magic Kingdom. And it's not just Seven Dwarfs Mine Train. I could wait two hours for Peter Pan's flight, which is an attraction that's about one minute long. I can wait almost three hours for Space Mountain. And now I've done those three attractions and basically my whole day is shot. Uh, but with that crowd calendar, I can start to find some optimizations even within these high crowd days. I can catch a seven at Hollywood Studios, which will make those wait times a little better. I can catch an eight uh, at Magic Kingdom. And again, that'll shift those wait times down a little bit. So I can start making some decisions. Beyond that, I can look at the predicted wait times for an attraction throughout the day. Uh, so on the top line here, we have crowd level 10 days. On the bottom level, we have crowd level one days. On the left is Seven Doors Mine Train. On the right is Dumbo. Different attractions have uh, different wait time patterns. And especially on low crowd days, these are really weird because people think they know how to visit Disney and they know you rope drop seven door mine train. As soon as that park opens, you go there. On a low crowd day, that's actually not the best thing to do because everyone's doing that. But then everyone in the park has already done seven doors mine train. And so the wait time drops. You're actually better served to wait. Uh, and you see similar things at Dumbo. But I can see that even on high those high crowd level days, really, if I'm OK with staying up late, and the park's open late, I can just wait to go on Seven Doors Mine Train till late in the evening. And instead of waiting two hours, I'm waiting 25 minutes. I think that's a much more reasonable use of my time. But this really isn't helpful unless you're like me and like slogging through spreadsheets and algorithms in the lead up up to your trip uh, until you make it real for humans. And so that's what we've done. We've made it able so that you can plan your own trip on your own day and just tell it what you want to do and have it come up with the optimal touring plan for you. And so I'm picking, I want to go to the Magic Kingdom tomorrow. My goodness, I wish that was real. Uh, and I can tell it what I want to do. So here's all the attractions that are going to be open tomorrow at Magic Kingdom. I can tell it, I want to go on Buzz Lightyear twice. I want to go on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad once. I go in and choose all these things. It lets me pick parades and other things as well. I can either say evaluate my plan or optimize it. And that's what we really want to do. We want to optimize our day and figure out where we should go first. And this plan comes back. In real life, it takes about a minute. Uh, but this is like the, that magic cooking show where I'm like, oh, here, it came out of the oven, perfectly baked. Uh, and it tells me to go to Buzz Lightyear twice right off the bat if I want to ride it twice then go to Space Mountain and beat the crowds there, and then work my way through the park in a way that avoids as much wait time as possible. So it's making me not crisscross the park all over the place, but I can do what I want to do in a way that makes sense and helps me avoid those waits. Bonus, now I can go on my phone instead of just doing this at my desktop at home and hoping I remember the steps to follow. And then I get real-time data. I can see what the wait time is expected to be like in the future. I can tell if Space Mountain goes down, I can get information about writing now or waiting uh, so that now it's responsive to what's happening in the parks real time. I think this is a really great way to sort of balance doing what I want to do and avoiding the waits, but not being tied to a step by step plan like we showed on the last picture and make some of my own choices about, OK, it told me to go to Space Mountain third. Space Mountain's down now instead of my plan being ruined for the day. Uh, now I can look and figure out where I should go next. It also, uh, so there I can see the expected wait time versus the posted wait time. Uh, Disney tends to inflate their posted wait times to make you think you're getting a really good deal. Well, I only waited two and I was supposed to wait five. I loved my vacation. Uh, but it also lets you time your wait, which then gives me more data to make more better informed decisions and suggestions in the future. So that was really quick. That was my 
fast forward version of what I'm doing and how I'm using this data and how I'm sharing it out. If you're interested in more deep dives, like I said, I blog and YouTube about this all the time. You can follow me on Instagram. You can look at my blog. Feel free to look me up on LinkedIn. Love finding new applications of this data and how we can help people have fun. I specifically left time for questions because people usually uh, like asking me questions about my data. Uh, so if anyone has any questions about Disney, about the algorithm that we're doing, anything along those lines, I would love to hear them. Are we gonna see any code? Not today because goodness, it took me that long just to give you the intro, essentially. So, <laughs> Great job, Becky. There's a few other questions in the chat. Um, some people are saying, where can we get it? Where is your yep. blog? Yeah. Linked to my blog. You can get the tools and the information at touringplans.com. I see someone got ahead of me, so I really appreciate that. Uh, a lot of this is free. There is some functionality behind paywalls, but we try to make it as free as possible as long as we can pay for the infrastructure that lets all these people uh, do it. Do I work with Disney on data from the park? So none of this is like officially Disney sanctioned or sponsored for very good reason. Uh, Disney has reasons to manipulate where people go at certain points in time. Uh, they want to manage crowds in a specific way. They're not really incentivized to tell you where to go to wait the least. <laughs> and that's what I like doing. Uh, so this isn't officially Disney sponsored at all. Uh, we kind of just scrape their publicly available data and use it for the good of the many is my goal. That's great. And someone was asking where you can find some of that data if they want to look for some of it themselves. Do you have any of that that you're willing to share, Becky? Uh, yeah. I, so I would say, especially if you're a data nerd that likes digging into this, just download Disney's app. Uh, it's called My Disney Experience. And I bet you could figure out how to scrape that info. <laughs> it's a good challenge. I'll set that forward for the audience today. Uh, awesome. and, and I like people giving their Disney stories, uh, seeing the original purpose of Disney. I think it's a fun place to go and sort of escape. But if you can use data to make it even better. Uh, and, and like I said, I have more tricks on how to save the money and how to hit things that might have higher satisfaction than others. That's what I'm all about. Oh my gosh, Becky, we might have time for one more tip if you have a short one that you want to Oh share yeah, with I mean, I don't have audience. the slides. Here's my number one tip that I give people when they want to save money on the Disney vacation. The most expensive part of your vacation will be the resort. Disney has made it so that if you want to have the best Disney experience, you have to stay in one of their on-property resorts. You can stay off property, uh, but on-property guests get to get into each park 30 minutes earlier than everyone else every day, and that makes a huge difference in those wait times. It's the best way to avoid waits. So in order to save money at the Disney resorts, they have a timeshare company called Disney Vacation Club. It's wildly expensive. I'm not a part of it. Uh, I am not here to sell Disney Vacation Club. Instead, people that are part of it tend to not be able to use all their points every year and they rent them out for cheap. Uh, so my family always travels by renting those Disney Vacation Club points. And that allows us to do things like stay at the Polynesian, which is typically a $700 per night resort. And we stayed there for $170 a night just by renting points. So that's the easiest way to save the most money with the least hassle and stay at really nice resorts at the same time. There you go. That's the Becky tip for today. There you go, everyone. The Becky tip of the day. And we got tech, we got tech insights. We got data right. insights. We got Disney park insights. Becky, thank you so much for joining us. You're today. welcome. Thank, thank you for having me. Really appreciate the opportunity. Well, have a great rest of the event. I know there are people who are going to be trying to find you and who are already sharing your website yes. over and over. Send me all the so. emails and LinkedIn connections. I love it. Perfect. All right. Good luck, everyone, with your next vacation. Thanks. <laughs>